Okay, if we could um, just take seats as time is short and people have things they have to leave to go to. And Jane, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, thank you for, for panel one for the discussion about the old world and the new world and certainly the migration of the new world into the old world, statistics that we can see through RLT. In this panel two, we're going to be talking about recent financing structures which have both a high yield bond and a term loan B in them and we'll be looking at those structures from a covenant perspective. Joining me on panel two, I have Sarah Goldsmith, who's our residence bonds experts and joined us from Moody's Covenant Office, as well as Jasmine Thorpe, who joined us more recently from the Ashurst Leverage Finance Department. Um, in case you don't know me, I'm Jane Gray, and I joined DXP a while ago, having been in-house in the Leverage Finance Department, as well as working in private practice at Lovells. When we're looking at the structures today, in terms of the loans, we will be staying obviously on the public side and looking only at the publicly disclosed information. However, we will use RLT to benchmark certain provisions within the larger term loan B world. Now, turning to our first structure, which um, the numericable LT structure, which still remains the largest financing we've seen in the high yield world to date. Um, as we can see, there is the numericable restricted group and sitting at a structurally pari passu level is a 3.7 billion euro term loan B and also therefore borrowed and issued out the same entity level, we have over 7 billion of senior secured notes. When I talk about pari passu, not only are they structurally pari passu, they are contractually pari passu due to their um, credit support being given both on an equal basis. We also see a super senior RCF, and by super senior, I mean that should there be an enforcement, enforcement proceeds go to pay out the RCF first. Now, what's particularly interesting about the numericable structure, as some of you may know, is it sits within a much larger, all-englobing Altice structure. And therefore, sitting outside the numericable group and in a structurally subordinated position at Altice SA level is an over four billion worth of senior unsecured notes, as well as a 200 million euro RCF. We also see within the Altice group, again, outside the numericable group, is over, is over 3.5 billion worth of total debt in the Altice International Group. And this is involved in the cold and hot financings that you may have seen coming across your desks. Um, as such, when we got the documentation, one of the first things that DXP looked at was value leakage, leaving the numericable group and going up to Altice. And therefore, my first question I'm going to address on the bond side to Sarah is how does the restricted payment covenant work in numericable? Well, as in most bond deals, there's a build-up basket that needs to accrue before numericable can pay um, dividends or distributions outside the restricted group. Uh, normally, we would see a build-up basket based on 50% of consolidated net income, or CNI, uh, plus certain additions like liquidated restricted investments. Here, though, um, it's very aggressive because the build-up basket is based on 100% of EBITDA, which means for every dollar of EBITDA, <laughs> they can then pay that out of the restricted group, as well as the other additions. And investors would also need to look at any EBITDA addbacks that would inflate that amount. Um, as well, outside the restricted, <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry, it's not just 100% of EBITDA. Right. 100% of EBITDA less one and a half times. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. Yes, you're absolutely right, absolutely right. Um, yes, it's, it's uh, yeah, yeah, repeat yourself, please. It's 100% of EBITDA yeah. minus, minus one and a half times of the interest expense up to that period. Right, and so it minus the interest expense. Um, uh, and you'd also have the additions as well, but you would, um, you would need to look at the EBITDA addbacks as well to see what inflates that, that amount as well. The point being they're not cash. Exactly. <laughs> That's my point. Um, and outside the build-up basket, 
NumeraCobble can also make payments um, outside the restricted group on, uh, based on carve-outs to the build-up basket. So even if you have a flat or negative amount in the build-up basket, you can still pay uh, payments outside the restricted group based on these carve-outs. Um, so, so how easily can NumeraCobble therefore pay restricted payments out of the group? Through these carve-outs? Yes. Um, very easily. They, um, in fact, this is a pretty aggressive structure in the fact that um, certain uh, carve-outs sort of invert the capital structure such that the equity holders can be paid out before the note holders. Um, there's one carve-out allowing um, uh, NumeraCobble to, you know, if certain elements are met, they can uh, uh, pay, pay up to the parent group, the Altice group, to um, service the senior notes and the RCF that are held by the Altice group. As well, um, there is a, a dividend allowed up to the parent based on a percentage of the, an IPO market cap, which is based on an IPO that happened before the notes were even issued. I think the notes were issued in, um, April. in April of 2014. And the IPO, I believe, was in the last part of 2013. Yeah. Yeah. November 2013. Yeah. Um, as well, there's uh, what's becoming a, a, what we've seen over the last year, there's become a very standard carve out allowing any restricted payment based on a leverage ratio. And, um, and here in these papers, the leverage ratio is a four times, uh, which is at the higher end of the market. So it doesn't matter what's in the build up basket. Uh, they can make, if the leverage ratio is four times, they can make any payment outside the restricted And that's group. on a pro forma basis? Yes. Okay. Um, and then, Jazz, to the extent that it's disclosed, mm -hmm. what does the TLB look like in NumeraCarbon? Well, in short, Jane, the TLB looks like the high yield bond. So the OM describes that the restricted, the key elements of the restricted payments provision mirrors that of the, in the, ter the term loan B is in the high yield bond. In fact, when we look at the different financing structures in the market that have both a high yield bond and a term loan B sitting together, um, what we're seeing is that the baseline amounts plus the additions that go up to make the build up basket will be the same in the high yield bond as in the term loan B. But the f obviously, when you look at this, this makes, um, this makes a lot of sense uh, because when you've got the high yield bond and the term loan B sitting in the same structure and they're pari passu, uh, the borrower group always going to be tied to the most um, restrictive covenant. So commercially, it makes sense they sit at the, at the same level. Okay, and just carrying on with NumeraCarble, and we have a simplified structure chart here, but we can already see there's a lot of leverage in the group. How much more leverage can be put on top of the NumeraCarble group, Sarah? Um, well, there are two ways um, through the debt covenant that NumeraCobble can incur debt. Uh, the first way, or I shouldn't even say the first or second, but one way is through the ratio debt basket, uh, which, um, which allows NumeraCobble and its guarantors to incur debt based on a certain leverage ratio. Here it's set at four times. Uh, and secure debt through a secure leverage ratio here that's set at 3.5 times. Um, my, uh, in looking at these ratios, uh, the investor should also look at the definitions to, to see what is or is not included in those ratios, because sometimes certain amounts are netted or excluded, netted out or excluded. Irrespective of the ratios included in the ratio debt basket, there are permitted debt baskets that allow a, uh, an, an issuer to incur debt. Um, so for instance, if you, here the ratio is set at four times, if um, the company's actual leverage is five times, they couldn't use the ratio debt basket to incur debt, but they could use the permitted debt baskets to incur debt. Um, and in this transaction, uh, we calculated that uh, an aggregate capped amount of 7.5 billion euros can be uh, incurred under those debt baskets. And that includes a credit facility debt basket uh, that's capped at the greater of 750 million euros and 4% of total assets, as well as a 6 billion euro uh, numericable SFA. Okay. Um, and on top of that, um, they can also secure those debt baskets um, up to 7.1 billion, uh, including the credit facility and the SFA. Uh, so, so yes, there, there's a, a great amount of room for them to incur leverage and secure it, um, which further subordinates these, the notes in the, 
or actually dilutes them because it's all on collateral that they can secure it. So it further dilutes the note holder's security. And you can reclassify the debt baskets as well. That's correct. So that's beginning to sound a lot like a term loan B that, that Topi spoke to us about in um, panel one. And to the, again, to the extent that we can say, is the leverage ceiling the same in the numeric arbitral term loan B? Yeah, again, Jane, we're seeing that both the leverage ceilings, so the standard leverage ceiling and then how much additional secured um, debt can be put into the group is the same in the term loan B as it is in the high yield bond. Um, using RLT to compare term loan Bs in the market, what we're seeing is that the Maricaba will sit on the medium level in terms of additional debt that can be put into the structure. Um, so we, the sort of top year end that we're seeing in terms of term loan Bs is about four and a half times to numerical, numerical was four times, whereas the sort of lower end we're seeing is three and a half times. Obviously, as we've kind of touched on before, what's really important is that the, the way that they calculate these leverage ceilings and going into seeing how much additional debt can actually be done in very different ways. So you need to look through the document and actually see how that can be done, not just at the leverage test. And that's something that obviously investors need to be wa very wary of. And, and here, when we're look, talking about those stats, we're talking about the, the leverage, the ratio stats. That's right, the ratio this stats. This is nothing to do with the debt baskets, which will also be in place exactly. in both sets of documentation. Um, Numeric Arbor also has a rating-based portability feature in it, that I know. <laughs> and I think everyone knows what portability is. Um, well, just very quickly, in case you don't, um, port portability, change control portability feature is the ability for the ownership structure to change without necessarily an ability for the lenders or note holders to exit. And that's because additional conditions have been put in, such as a leverage level or the absence of a ratings downgrade. And in America, well, it's a rating, absence of a ratings downgrade. Sarah, this ratings um, portability test, is it more aggressive or the same as what we've seen recently? Well, um, in principle, I think a portability clause would always be deemed aggressive because um, the change of control provisions really are the investor's primary protection against a material change in the business in which they've invested. Uh, in a standard deal, the change of control provisions, if one was triggered, for instance, a sale of substantially all assets or um, a change of the majority in the board of directors, uh, would trigger a 101% put of the bonds. And in numericable, what's happening is if uh, it's a very specific provision, so that if Vivendi uh, is, owns 20% or more share ownership of numericable, uh, a change of control event would also have to be accompanied by a ratings decline in order for that change of control put to be triggered. Um, we've only seen one ratings uh, portability clause this year in 2014, and that's in numericable. Uh, over the last 12 months, two other deals had it, Granger and TV and Opco. Mm -hmm. And Numeric Cobbles is actually slightly more protective in the sense that it has that proviso that Vivendi has to own 20% or more shares uh, to have the ratings decline attached. If Vivendi no longer owns the 20% or more shares, if they own less than 20%, then the ratings decline goes away. Uh, that element of the change of control provision goes away such that a trigger event would only have to happen to trigger the put. And the other two deals we've seen through in the last 12 months, um, the ratings decline attaches throughout the life of the bond. Um, that being said, what we have seen over the last 12 months increasingly is a specified change of control event, which is a different type of portability clause. Uh, well, it's a portability clause, but what it does instead is a specified change of control event is a defined term within the documents. And basically what it says is that if um, a change of control trigger event happens and the leverage ratio is below a certain amount, then the trigger event does not trigger a put. So the put will not happen if the leverage ratio is a certain amount. And we've seen this in 38 out of 125 deals over the last 12 months. So it's, it's, um, that's what investors are now using more of. So it's interesting that Numeric Cobble has this ratings okay. decline feature. And so just stepping away from Numeric Cobble a moment <coughs> with regards to portability, uh, is there portability in term loan Bs? Well, Jane, while we, while we have seen portability in term loan Bs and also LMA style documents, it's still not common for term loan Bs to have portability. 
And when we do see portability provisions in a term loan B, um, it tends to be much, much more restrictive than what we see in a high yield bond. Um, and it will often include a lot of conditional conditionality around how that can be affected, um, including looking at who the original investors can transfer their interest to um, before the change of control event is actually triggered. So this, the, the transferees can often, be, can often be restricted to certain PE houses or certain sovereign wealth funds of a, of a certain size. Um, they may also have a certain requirement that the committed capital or the managed assets of the transferee is as, at least the same value as the original investments who are doing the, doing the, the sale. Okay, and I think, I think in portability that would be those extra conditions would also apply in a European loan. Mm -hmm. And I just would like to mention here just that in a term loan B, change of control is put in the event de of default mm -hmm. provisions and not in the prepayment exactly. as you would see in a European loan. I mean, one of the things that we're going to be tracking at DXP going forward is to see whether, firstly, whether term loan B start to incorporate portability um, on a much more frequent basis, um, and whether they start to loosen the, the conditionality around portability so that it starts to mirror the high yield bond world like we're seeing happening with other types of provisions. Okay. Question. Don't even mind, but what's the consequence of it being in the event of default? Well, it means that the lenders would have to accelerate rather than an automatic prepayment event generally. Obviously, if there's portability features in there, there's extra conditions attaching. But that's a very generalized answer. And are there any more questions uh, on Numericarbol or just about what we've spoken? Or should we move on to the next structure? OK, just moving on quickly. Here we have Passion, which again, another term loan B high yield bond structure. Again, you can see that in terms of the issuer borrower, uh, the, the notes and the loan are structurally pari passu. There's also a working cap facility, an RCF of $200 million. Um, but although the notes and the, the bonds share in the same guarantor coverage, in this case, the loans are, um, are secured. The term loan B is secured such that it is senior to the value of the security that it has been provided. Um, sitting outside the structure, again, we have structurally subordinated debt, but in this case, we have a 200 million euro pick um, notes. So when we looked at this deal, I saw that DXP had rated Patheon very weak. And I was wondering, Sarah, if you could just explain why we think Patheon is so weak. Well, um, this is a very aggressive structure within the covenant package, um, and, but a few of them really are very striking that we haven't seen in Europe yet. And, and it could, and it is probably because of Patheon's US element that we see this, this aggressiveness. Um, but for instance, um, one thing that we've never seen in Europe before is if the leverage ratio is a certain level, here it's set at 5.25 times, which is rather high, then uh, proceeds from an asset sale can be used to build up the build-up basket for restricted payments. And what this effectively does is you can sell an asset, and then those proceeds can be paid out of the restricted group as a dividend or a distribution. Um, so this is very aggressive. We, we don't see that in, in Europe uh, in, this, in this way. Um, and as well, the, um, the, the restricted payment ratio based um, payment uh, is present as well, but it's at a very high ratio, it's at five times. So if the leverage ratio is five times, then the issuer can make any restricted payment outside of the restricted group. Um, and also, very unusually for a bond, all debt that's incurred under the ratio debt basket and all the permitted debt baskets, so every debt that can be incurred under the debt covenant can be secured by a permitted lien um, if the secured leverage ratio is five times or less, which is a rather high ratio as well, um, this secured debt would further subordinate these unsecured note holders. Um, so, hence the very weak <laughs> rating. <laughs> um, and then, just in terms of the Patheon term loan B, is it also as aggressive as the high yield bond? Um, and have you seen equivalent provisions in any other term loan B? Well, the, the Pavian OM doesn't go into details um, on these provisions specifically, so obviously we can't discuss that. Um, but obviously what we've seen from our discussion on Miracarbal, um, in terms of the key metrics around certain leverage and value leakage, leakage provisions, where we have a high yield bond and a term loan B sitting in the same structure, 
it's it's common for them to, to track each other and, and mirror, mirror those provisions. So on that basis, you could make an assumption that we see that tracked across Sympathium. Um, but looking at RLT and term loan Bs generally, where we've seen a very high leverage test for restricted payments, so five times, or we've even seen up to five, five and a half, six times, um, the ability to make those restricted payments will be will generally be restricted to a specific source of funds, so the build-up basket that we've talked a lot about today. Under term loan Bs, where we've seen the ability to make restricted payments that aren't linked to a specified source of funds, so you can make it out of any funds that you have available, um, the highest leverage we've seen is three to three and a half times in the term loan B world. Um, so it's still not getting up to the same point as the high yield bonds and path, you know, on, on a general general basis. But turning to, to Sarah's subordination point, we also see in term loan Bs, as you do in the high yield bond world, the ability to secure the permitted debt, um, be it ratio base or carve out base. Um, a five time leverage test in term loan B world is going to be at the top. So what we're seeing in Pathian is basically at the top of what we would see in a term loan B um, for the ability to incur additional secured debt. And obviously, as, as um, Topi mentioned, as we talked about, there's obviously the two leverage tests that, that exist in the term loan B world in terms of the ability to secure additional debt. We're looking at the first lien leverage test um, and also the second lien leverage test. So the first lien leverage test is in terms of pari passu debt. And what we've been seeing commonly, the ratio test, the ratio level is set at 3.5 to 3.75 times for first lien, and in terms of the ability to incur, incur additional secured debt that's junior, um, then, then we're looking at sort of at the top end around five and a half times. Okay, well thank you. Now we've just spoken about some key provisions, and I would like to ask the audience, see if you're all still awake, um, whether they still expect better protections in a term loan B in terms of leverage and value leakage and other key metrics than they would in a high yield bond. So you need to give us the, which one do you Okay. Want? Who expects better protections in a term loan B? Yeah. And I think <laughs> that would be right and it's very much um, what we at DXP is our position because in, in certain areas they're still much tighter, for example, conditions around incrementals or permitted acquisitions than they are in a term loan B. However, I think what is quite interesting, than a bond, sorry. <laughs> what is quite interesting um, from our perspective is as high yield bonds have over the last couple of years become a really solid asset class in Europe, we can see that the trend of term loan Bs coming into Europe and also coming into the European documentation is much more aggressive and feels much, uh, those terms are evolving in a much faster pace than they were, for example, um, and this may be because of the high yield bond trend very much being active at the moment. Um, it is quite interesting to think that there is some migration from loans into bonds, for example, the restricted payments leverage test, which came in a couple of years ago into bonds and has become very much standard. Um, I think going forward, as, as we wrap up this seminar, there's just a couple of elements that we'll be tracking going forward. And that's how much these high yield term loan B provisions and metrics and mechanisms continue to move into the European documentation. I think this week has shown that it's very much going to be the case. And we'll see that, that this will continue, is, is my feeling on the trend. But also, within the more protective at the moment term loan B, how much the other areas of term loan Bs and therefore European documentation will weaken because of the impact of high yield bonds and the flexibility that <coughs> borrower groups now certainly expect in any senior secured instrument. Um, if there are any questions about what we've spoken about or not, then I would ask Stephen just to, to wrap up. I'll do that very fast. <laughs> I mean, once again, if I can just... Uh, say thank you to the panel and perhaps we can give them a quick uh, round of applause. And thank you um, to everybody for being here. Um, the one thing I think that I would say is that, I mean, there are many things to take from these panels, such as the extraordinary levels of complexity that have been introduced into the market. Um, it is the case that the only place that you can actually 
get access to this information um, in a reasonably digestible form and then use it to actually track and compare across the market is the Dead Explained databases. And self-evidently, if you're not already using them, I would commend them to you. Otherwise, thank you very much for your time. Um, do stay for some more coffee. I'm not sure if there are any more bacon rolls. I suspect not, but who knows. Um, and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks very much. Have a great day. Bye.